This is the Moral Science Podcast, and I'm your host, Amber Cazell. In this series, I get to interview experts in my favorite subject, the scientific study of human morality, virtues and vices, evolution of morals, the judgment action gap, character development, the philosophy of morality, transcendent experiences, researchers' moral biases, cultural values, plus the obligatory trolley dilemma. We are going to talk about it all. Dr. Brad Owens is an associate professor in the Marriott School of Management at Brigham Young University. There, his teaching and research focus on ethical leadership in business. His work examines the impact of humility on leader effectiveness, relational energy, and team functioning, and has received a number of awards and funding from the Academy of Management, as well as the Templeton Foundation. Brad's work has also received wide media coverage, including in the Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, and Harvard Business Review. In this podcast, Brad and I discuss the details of what humility is, how it is often mischaracterized, and its effects for business leaders. All right. Hi, everybody. Today, I'm excited to be with Brad Owens. Brad is a friend of mine and a mentor of mine. We've collaborated on a couple of projects from my doc while well, I was in my doctoral program and continuing on today. So I'm really excited to be here with Brad. Brad is a business professor and he teaches courses on business ethics and his research niches in humility, which is pretty exciting space and I'm looking forward to learning more about um, some of the research history that he has that I've just heard tidbits of over the years. Um, So Brad, thanks so much for for agreeing to come on the podcast today. Thank you, Amber. It's great to be with you. Um, So Brad, I always start these podcasts out by hearing about researchers' backgrounds and I'm curious. I don't know that we've really discussed it much. How did you come to be interested in business ethics? Um, How did you become a business professor? Why are you researching humility? Um, Great questions. Um, So how did I become interested in becoming a business professor? Um, I actually had no idea what professors did or, you know, what research even was. Um, And I had a, a career project in my master's program where I had to interview a bunch of people about their careers. And um, on a whim, just decided to include a, to throw a professor in there and just was blown away at um, how much I loved what they said about the lifestyle of a professor and how much autonomy they had and kind of creative uh, license and the balance between teaching and doing research just sounded like a, a really full and rich career path. And so that's kind of what set me off generally toward um, pursuing a degree in uh, academia. Um, and I, I was always kind of interested as I read biographies and, and kind of books on history about leadership. And so um, mm-hmm. I kind of gravitated toward this, uh, this field of, of business and, and management, um, a core piece or a big piece of the research in, in this field has to do with how to lead well or how to motivate people or um, mm-hmm. create visions for organizations. So um, I guess in, in a nutshell, that's kind of where um, that ambition came from or that interest. Yeah. Um, yeah. So as, as far as um, business ethics, that was kind of a transition. I was kind of a pure organizational behavior HR guy uh, for a, f- a few years and then was recruited here to the Marriott School of Business to teach ethics. Um, in part because they saw my research on leader humility as having clear kind of moral underpinnings. Um, Mm. And so, yeah, so to answer your question, it was kind of just an accidental uh, thing, you know, no grand vision from the beginning, just kind of incrementally making uh, small decisions that led here. Yeah, cool. So did you think of humility as moral yourself before like were you thinking of that from a moral frame of reference before going to BYU? Not entirely. I'm from the beginning I was just thinking in terms of leader effectiveness. Um, So I first happened upon the idea of leader humility when reading the popular book Good to Great by Jim Collins where he talks about um, the concept of level five leaders 
those who have kind of this paradoxical blend of intense professional will and competence and decisiveness, everything we think of from the typical um, top-down leader, but then combined all that with humility that uh, fosters lots of great outcomes. And so I thought that was a, a really curious combination. And so went into the academic literatures to try and find more information about humility and um, just couldn't really find very much. There's a lot of people that wrote about it in theoretical terms, but not a lot of um, concrete details and, and nobody had really tried to or had successfully measured it. Um, hmm. And so initially it was just leadership effectiveness and, and how to maybe temper some of the stronger characteristics of leadership. And it's only since then that I've come to uh, understand and, and read about how much humility is at the very root of, of moral philosophy in the minds of, of many people. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So it sounds like your interest really originated from a popular book that triggered you going into the literature and, and feeling dissatisfied with what you were finding there. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So what were your first steps then um, in terms of research? How did, I mean, it sounds, I know you've done work with creating measures of humility. I also know from our conversations over the years that you have well-formed opinions about um, the construct of humility and how to define it. it. Was that your starting place? Uh, yeah. So um, what I did, I love Jim Collins' book on humility, and I thought he did a pretty good job um, in in defining it. But but as I looked to create more nuance and and kind of kind of uh, identify different perhaps dimensions of humility that kind of represented this overall construct or or behaviors that could be uh, reflected on a measure. Um, I, I, th those, that level of detail is what I wasn't able to find. And so with a couple of research assistants, we combed the literature uh, on humility. We looked at philosophical and psychological journals and independently kind of made note and kind of content analyzed what was out there and then came back and discussed and tried to boil it all down as best we could into a concrete definition that we could then use to create a measure. And in some cases we found uh, because humility has such a rich history, um, one definition had 13 different dimensions. And oh, wow. uh, yeah, making it an unwieldy construct to uh, operationalize into a measure. And so um, through a process of kind of uh, identifying what are the dimensions that seem to be most core um, what are kind of ideas or behaviors that uh, stem from humility, but maybe not represented by the core attribute of humility. Um, kind of parsing this, um, these concepts apart, we, we settled on three core dimensions of humility. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear about those. Let, let's talk about those. Yeah, so the first dimension that was, I think if my memory is serving me correctly, it was mentioned the most often from our independent um, analysis of the literature was a willingness to see oneself accurately. Mm -hmm. And the idea of a, a willingness to see oneself accurately is important because achieving perfect self-awareness is, is maybe not possible, but humble individuals embrace the journey or the quest to uh, accurate self, self-awareness. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, there's quite a bit of literature in psychology about those who have an inflated sense of self um, have lots of maladaptive outcomes um, and it's kind of a brittle ego defense system and less uh, social poise and presence. And um, there's, there's lots of benefits to instead trying to understand the self accurately and then they don't have the, taxing burden of trying to um, defend or maintain an inflated persona. Mm. Uh, so that was the first one. The second one was 
an appreciation of others' strengths and contributions. Um, humble individuals are not threatened when they see other people who have strengths uh, or who make contributions that they have not made or strengths that they, do, they don't have. Instead, they're willing to um, draw attention to uh, the strengths and contributions of others so that everyone can learn from these individuals. And uh, in, in, so, in some ways, humility is like social learning on steroids, mm -hmm. where you become uh, the student, a student of the strengths of those around you. And, and then you have a more nuanced idea of the kind of interpersonal resources around you and people that you can learn from, go to, you see mentors everywhere um, who can help you in, in uh, specific ways to, to continue to grow or uh, to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, so humble individuals see others not as rivals, um, but as exemplars from whom they might learn. Mm -hmm. It helps someone transcend the comparative, competitive social lens that seems natural to most of us. And then the last dimension is teachability. And this is this willingness to, uh, to be open to learning, feedback, new ideas from others, uh, to seek advice, to have a continual desire to learn. Um, and so these three dimensions uh, we used, we, we developed a, a bunch of items reflecting these three dimensions. And then through the process of um, administering to five different samples, we were able to whittle it down to a reliable, um, a measure that had, um, was differentiated from existing and related constructs, but also was predictive of some important outcomes. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So when you were talking about that first dimension, a willingness to see oneself accurately, I wonder if you could speak to kind of the distinction between um, modesty and humility mm. here because you know like you were giving the example of not thinking of yourself in an inflated way and I think in the past you've kind of also contrasted humility with modesty mm -hmm. yeah so I, I see modesty as as not being boastful and sometimes underselling one's accomplishments um, and in some cases withholding positive information about the self. Mm. Um, I see modesty is differing from humility in that modesty doesn't really have to do with a motivation for personal learning or development per se. Mm. Um, it's just having the social sensitivity not to draw too much attention to or talk about the self too much or to boast about the self. Uh, so I definitely think they would be related, but there's just aspects of humility uh, related to personal learning and self-awareness uh, that uh, modesty does not capture. Do you think of modesty as a virtue as well? I, I do. Um, I, I don't know if it's quite as powerful over time. Um, I think you won't ruffle fe feathers with modesty and uh, people will feel more comfortable around you generally. Um, but I think that there's something deeper with humility that uh, reflects a positive kind of self journey towards developing in lots of different virtuous and instrumental aspects of the self. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, this sort of reminds me of this idea I've heard thrown around a bit that humility is a gateway virtue or like a master virtue. Yeah, I've, I've heard of it that way, as well as like a mother virtue that gives birth to the others, um, where it provides both the self-awareness to see what gaps you currently have in your character, as mm -hmm. well as um, kind of an innate belief in personal development that not only can you kind of perceive those gaps, but that there's something you can do about it, that through effort and learning from others and being teachable, you actually can help begin to bridge those gaps. Yeah, interesting. Um, so do you, it sounds like you agree with that view? Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah. Um, how, I'm curious too about to what degree there's shared 
consensus around the definition of humility and sort of the factors that you're putting forward. Um, what's your take on that? Do you get the sense that researchers are coming to a consensus? I think we're getting closer in psychology as well as in, in business. There's been more a kind of an explosion of research in the last, you know, eight, 12 years, I would say. And um, typically literatures do begin over time to kind of uh, congeal around a definition. Um, my take on humility has been more kind of uh, social or interpersonal, like the displayed manifestations of humility. Mm. Um, my interest was in organizational context, which is a, a rich social environment and especially the, the interactions between leaders and organizational members. Um, others in psychology have taken a more kind of uh, intrapersonal view of humility, um, viewing humility as one of the intellectual virtues that is worth cultivating. Mm. And so I, I think that there's those who have the uh, more social bent on humility. And it seem, see, from what I've seen, the definitions are are pretty close. There may be a dimension, kind of an extra dimension here or, or a, a phrasing that's a bit different, um, but intellectual humility and then social humility, those definitions seem to be um, more, there's more consensus around those definitions um, over time that I've seen. Okay. And could you define intellectual humility for me? I'm not sure that I, really know what that means um i can try i'm not I'm not an expert on intellectual humility um but i do know that it has a lot to do with the degree to which um you are open in it it relates to this idea of teachability even though it's kind of an internal inside your own mind type of a um uh, construct um and the confidence with which you attached to your own opinions, you know, you, you leave open the possibility that uh, the conclusions you've arrived at may be altered with subsequent information and rather than some this intellectual rigidity about one's views and conclusions. Um, mm. So it's, it's cognitively or intellectually seeing that you, you, you may have gaps or limits and rather than being diffident about that, you're motivated to, to try and, again, continue to learn and to, to refine your thinking and to be open to others. And so it's just, a, just more humility inside one's own mind. And certainly that influences the way that people talk to others and, and the questions they ask. Um, but at its heart, it's just rooted in that kind of cognitive stance that you have towards your own positions, your thoughts, and uh, your current knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I want to shift gears now and talk a bit about some of the empirical work you've done looking at humility um, in organizations. So mm -hmm. it sounds to me like you did a lot of construct work with humility first and then moved into examining it in action. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what were some of your first empirical studies with humility in leadership? So with regard to leadership, uh, we found a company that was willing to let us gather a bunch of data. It was a healthcare company. And um, we found in this particular organization that leaders who scored higher on humility and we had the employees actually rate their leaders on humility. And then we took a consensus score uh, of, of those humility ratings. Mm -hmm. um, and we found that leaders who showed more humility were more likely to retain their talented employees. So high performing employees like to work for humble leaders. Um, mm. Maybe they feel more listened to. They just feel more engaged. Generally the leaders sharing credit. Um, and so uh, the job attitude that kind of uh, linked leader humility to uh, re job retention was uh, job satisfaction. 
those employees were much more satisfied in their work and uh, therefore they were um, more motivated to stay and, and to work hard. So another finding that we had uh, in the same organization was that leaders who show humility foster what's called a learning goal orientation in those that they lead. Hmm. And that's where the employee, rather than doing their work to try to kind of impress and prove their competence to others, um, they are inclined to uh, be motivated to try to select harder tasks, to choose higher goals, tougher goals, in order to develop, to grow, and to learn. And there's lots of great outcomes that uh, occur when you have employees that have a learning goal orientation versus a performance goal orientation. Performance is really important, um, but learning goal, goal oriented employees actually perform better over time and they, they grow their, their value over time as well. So that's interesting. That kind of reminds me of the, the fixed mind, like some of the mindsets work with Carol Dweck. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. In fact, le learning goal orientation is rooted in that um, growth mindset. And then the perform performance goal orientation is rooted in the fixed mindset. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, very cool. So, and you at one point had mentioned like really a really interesting study that you did with, I, I want to say it was the Marines. Was it the Marines? Um, with West Point. With West Point. Mm -hmm. uh, with, yeah, with that study, um, Colonel uh, Jordan Swain, uh, who is in charge of the leadership development curriculum uh, at West Point, he um, gave me a call, I think it was the day he defended his dissertation at Yale, um, which was entitled Humility in Military Leadership. And uh, he called and he said, we need to do something together. Um, he'd been thinking a lot about uh, humility even before his dissertation and, and why it's important in the military. Um, and someone in his position where he gets these really impressive cadets who come in, who've been very high achieving all their lives, and they, they make it into West Point, which is difficult to do. And then they are given really excellent training and um, they're, they're often told um, that they're the best of the best. And, and J Colonel Swain said their training is excellent. Um, and this is based on my, my memory. I'm trying to piece together this conversation, but that, but the humility is something we need to learn how better to kind of legitimize as an important piece of an overall suite of leadership approaches or, or characteristics um, because overconfidence they've learned just from kind of anecdotal evidence and the after action reviews um, after a mission as they evaluate how things went that overconfidence or arrogance hubris it really endangers people and can get people killed mm. and whereas humility uh, enables a leader to kind of value um, and empathetically understand the fears, you know, and value the lives of the soldiers more than their own career. Uh, and uh, it helps to, to save uh, and, and prevent undue loss of life. Uh, so we've been over to West Point uh, to interview West Point trained leaders who've been out in the field and then have been invited back to West Point to train the next generation of, of officers. And, um, asking them to share with us stories from combat and special forces missions about how leader humility, um, I mean, does it have a place in, in military leadership? When is it a good idea? When, when it is, a, is it a bad idea? Um, how does it influence um, the soldiers during, you know, missions afterwards and even after they go home from a PTSD standpoint, are there any connections there when, a leader is, is willing to kind of show humility and, and kind of their own humanness. Um, and the things that we learned were um, pretty powerful. And uh, first of all, 
at least to us, we, we felt that um, there seems to be uh, some very important uh, psychological benefit for a leader to be able to say, maybe after the mission is over and, and the leader's gotten them through a very difficult and dangerous situation, for the leader to able, be able to say to the soldiers, you know, I also was uh, very scared, you know, out of my mind, uh, even though I didn't show it back there because I needed to get us through there. And it's okay for you that it's very difficult to process what we all just saw. Um, you're still a good soldier. You still belong. Um, and so I just, you know, spending some of that kind of leadership capital by opening up their, you know, own re reactions to a very difficult situations helps a soldier to also be able to say, my kind of battle um, proven and experienced leader also had a similar human reaction to something uh, very awful that we just experienced. And it, it again helps them to not feel so isolated psychologically, like everyone's okay with this except for me. Everyone's handling this so well except for me. Mm -hmm. And that's what humility helps to kind of break down and create instead connections and maybe ways of psychologically processing, making sense of, and healing from uh, some of the very difficult things that the soldiers have to see and go through. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you had told me that you actually, in addition, I want to say you, you um, got some empirical evidence for the hypothesis that humility in leaders might save lives or save injuries from happening. At this point, we have just the, the qualitative evidence. So we're doing a qualitative study first. And we're talking with Colonel Swain, Dr. Swain, and putting together a, a field study uh, where we hopefully can train some cadet leaders to train and prepare for a specific field mission with uh, more humility in showing more humility in their approach and then others with kind of a more kind of neutral leadership approach mm -hmm. and observing whether or not there are, there's more adaptability or um, whether or not the different groups perform differently uh, in tasks. These wouldn't be life or death tasks, uh, but ones where there's quite a few metrics about success and, and leadership effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So, we're working on that, um, but actually going into the field and gathering empirical data is something that uh, we hope to do in the future, but we haven't been able to kind of put that together just yet. Got it. Yeah, I didn't realize that this research was ongoing. How cool. Um, it's very, very interesting and, and also refreshing to see some of this work being applied in such important contexts. Um, so is are you helping to develop a humility um development program there at west point or i'm curious like how one goes about developing humility yeah cultivating that um with west point uh colonel swain he wrote some a book chapter and he has uh, some curricula that he's using in order to train the cadets on humility Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, I think it's the first year that he's been using it. And so we are learning how effective it is and getting feedback about it. Um, aside from what's happening at West Point, some colleagues and I have been um, engaging some corporate and other business um, audiences and taking them through some trainings that are based on these three dimensions that I mentioned. And um, some self-reflective exercises and uh, ho hopefully adding uh, them going back into their organizations and getting kind of ongoing feedback about how this humility, humility development is, is going and, and the effects it's having. Um, we do have some research uh, in China having to do with, we call it this nostalgia uh, project. And that's where the leaders actually reflect on a uh, positive past experience. It's this self-affirmation, uh, self-validation idea where psychological resources are 
kind of cultivated at the beginning of the day that enables a person then to um, have the kind of wherewithal to, to display humility, which in some cases it can take some psychological resources um, to admit mistakes or admit what you don't know. Mm-hmm. And so having those the daily kind of psychological sprucing up or boosting through the self-affirmation process is something we're, we're looking into to see whether or not that could be one viable way for, for developing humility. But um, the, in our kind of engagement with people and trying to help them to really embrace this, we really don't come across people, very many people who don't think that humility is a good idea uh, in leadership. Uh, in most cases, they feel like they've had enough uh, leaders, they've observed others who have had too little humility and they've observed their effects or how they personally, personally felt being led by such a leader. Um, but I think that there's a difference between being you know, aware of and, and thinking it's a good idea versus having the skill to actually incorporate it or for the idea of humility and leadership to go from one's head to kind of to their heart where they're motivated to kind of uh, embrace and practice it. And, and that's an important uh, idea. Aristotle viewed virtues like humility as m- more like skills that we choose to develop rather than innate traits that we either have or we don't. Right. And so besides kind of defining what we mean by humility and relating some research that shows why it's effective, really convincing people that humility is more like a habit that you can choose to inculcate, you know, reflexively into your, into your kind of daily interactions. Um, Cause unless they believe that uh, it, it, it's very difficult to, help them to develop it uh, if they believe it's an innate trait or they have become this fixed mindset about humility. Right. Right. Really interesting. So in our last minutes here, I would love to hear some more about kind of what ideas you're chewing on, what research is in the pipeline for you. Um, and what you might want to see other scholars pick up on from your work and run with, or just general ideas you'd like to see fleshed out and developed more. Mm. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a great question. That's certainly uh, something that co-authors and I are are talking about and thinking about quite a bit. I'm fascinated with how psychologists are using MRIs and EEG data in order to kind of link the hard sciences with the soft sciences and understand what are the neural kind of networks that uh, are associated with some of these psychological constructs yeah. uh, like humility. And so currently working with um, some scholars at Arizona State uh, who have been doing a lot of this work, they, they use EEG kind of caps that they put on people's heads and then they have them engage in tasks. And um, we are, we have some data and and the beginnings are are encouraging where we're finding um, that there seems to be some uh, specific neural pathways that uh, are correlated with a leader's uh, penchant towards narcissism versus humility. And Mm -hmm. so that's a, a place where, we want to go further. Hopefully it can generate some insight that could be useful for development uh, or just understanding the construct from a, a physiological standpoint. Yeah. Um, yeah. So also with just the idea of developing humility, that's something that I think most leadership scholars say we, we need to get better at empirically capturing the effect of developmental efforts. And so that's always going to be something that, that we're interested in. Um, the antecedents of humility, um, whether it's life experiences or other personality traits or uh, salient life uh, events, um, I think would also be important to understand, again, to inform development. We have some uh, qualitative statements about individuals who 
uh, experienced um, a very inspiring mentor who in their own way was uh, very accomplished, successful, powerful, but yet showed a lot of humility. So, um, and this individual before that feeling like humility is not something that they necessarily wanted to embrace in their leadership, but when they observed this individual up close that inspired them, that it really opened them up to wanting to emulate uh, this individual. Um, we also have some anecdotal evidence that um, when people experience significant life reversals or are acquainted with how fragile life is, sometimes that also changes them and, and, and helps them to, to really embrace virtues like humility. So understanding these types of kind of the underpinnings or antecedents of humility more fully and getting empirical about these antecedents, I think is an important path forward uh, mm -hmm. for this literature. Yeah. You know, as you were finishing that, and, and this is backtracking a bit, but I was thinking about what you said that a lot of people don't like, like they agree that humility is needed. And yet, when I think about maybe not corporate business, but like small startups, I often think about um, entrepreneurial types that I don't associate with humility that go out and pull off these big unicorn business success stories. <laughs> um, so I, I'm a little bit surprised that there seems to be a disconnect between these broader societal narratives that I, I mean, maybe I have a skewed view because I'm kind of involved in the, in the startup world, but that you should like go big or go home, be bold, be um, like stretch your limits, try to pull off something that, you know, doesn't, doesn't seem like an accurate view of the self in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm surprised about like a disconnect between that and then what you've actually witnessed in your research and in your, your, um, practicing. <laughs> yeah. The, the startup uh, personality is an interesting one. And I think it takes lots of different strengths to really be successful. And I, I am aware of some research about like angel investor and, and what characteristics they look for in people they choose to ultimately invest in. Um, or the, you know, the leads, leaders of startups that they choose to, to give money to. And um, they definitely are looking for someone who's extremely confident that they can persevere through huge amounts of, of adversity. Um, and, and I think most people who begin startups are aware, hopefully, that it's, uh, the vast majority of them don't work. And so you have to be have the kind of personality to to risk just engaging in a, in a, in that kind of a risky venture, right. uh, but at the same time, um, angel investors also want to see that this person is willing to take feedback from them who are going to many of them comprise their own board of directors. Mm -hmm. um, they need to see someone who's willing to adapt according to market changes um, and uh, willing to, 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 to be learning continually in order to, again, try and take um, advantage of, of oh. opportunities to pivot or, or you know, competitive um, advantages that, uh, that present themselves so um, I, I think that, uh, like Jim Collins mentioned in his level five leadership uh, idea that you need someone with intense professional will, um, but if, that's, if they don't have something to help temper or guide that, uh, like the characteristics, uh, the dimensions of humility, then s sometimes those strong characteristics can actually be someone's undoing. Mm. Um, and I think it was Marshall Goldsmith, if I'm remembering right, he wrote a book called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Um, and basically this idea that you have individuals who have achieved some success in their careers, um, but in order to get to the very top of organizations, um, 
using the, the hard driving kind of authoritative, decisive, larger than life um, kind of tactics of influence and, and leadership are just not necessarily going to work. And they, you, there needs to be what's called, um, oh, I, I was reading this Harvard Business Review article and it's called the second uh, leadership rebirth or something like that, that where yeah. you you do your own personal pivot and reinventing where you add humility to these other characteristics. And then that enables you to build a team and to build that deep level of, of trust with others and actually learn from um, an, a broader set of experts. As you ascend and go up an organization, there's so much more uh, for you to know and to manage that you can't really keep track of yourself. You become increasingly reliant on uh, experts and specialists and it becomes increasingly difficult for any one person to just figure it all out at the top. And so you, adding humility to the mix uh, is really important. So a startup person, they are the entire organization from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And so they, they need to be able to be all those things. And uh, that might be one of the reasons why it's so difficult to do this is having a person that's that complete individual. Uh, and of course, there are exceptions, you know, people who lack humility who become very successful, but um, the benefits of humility enable, I think, competitive advantage over time and mm -hmm. adaptability and ongoing learning. Um, so... I'm not sure if I answered your question directly, but I think it's a fascinating idea that we, we see people who are so, um, so self-confident in, in their vision of, of this product they want to bring to market and they kind of need to be. Um, but uh, hopefully we can make a case that uh, take all of that and then add humility to it as well and uh, your chances of success increase. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. In general, have you, as a researcher, seen changes in how like pop culture orients towards humility? Like, this is sort of a broad question, but mm -hmm. you know, like when I when I I was speaking with a researcher who um, worked out of Florida, and I think I think she takes more of a um, modesty kind of a definition of humility. Mm -hmm. um, but she was saying like almost the opposite, like everybody out there, these college students, I should say, college student samples out in Florida are like, well, mo like this is dumb. Why would any, like th it's not a good thing that people reach for. Um, now maybe that's partly because she's using a, just a different definition, mm -hmm. but I'm curious if you've seen like approaches or attitudes towards humility change over the years. I think that since like the turn of the millennium, when positive psychology started to really um, kind of get bigger in the kind of collective psyche of uh, what we, we should be understanding like uh, humans, uh, we understand so much of, what's wrong and, and how humans are broken, but really the mission of social science and psychology in particular is to understand the entire breadth of human functioning. And that's opened up, I think, a lot of science as well as kind of popular dialogue about virtues like humility uh, mm -hmm. and, and what place they have in our contemporary world. Um, and so I, because I've been looking for these and kind of getting a pulse on what what are people talking about with regard to humility um, and how well is it being embraced? I see lots and lots of evidence of, of uh, popular articles in business and uh, other places saying that, that humility is becoming more and more kind of um, embraced and seen as needed. Um, at the Also at the turn of the millennium, we had a bunch of uh, pretty large scale corporate scandals that many of which were attributed to the hubris and sense of entitlement and narcissism of the executives involved. Mm -hmm. And so there was this perceived crisis of leadership 
uh, where we seem to be there's something missing in the business student training and socialization that we're given to to these budding and next generation business leaders. We need to make some changes in order to help avoid creating these types of business leaders that are involved in these uh, large scale scandals that hurt a lot of people. And, and humility was identified as part of that remedy uh, mm -hmm. in solving this crisis of leadership. And so since then, there's quite a bit of popular press articles that you can find where people are advocating, you know, we need to understand this more and embrace it. Um, there's also scholars that, that say humility sounds nice. Um, I know there's a book Jeff Pfeffer wrote, um, and I, I know Jeff, um, about how, you know, leadership uh, and who really understands power and how to, to keep uh, and, and leverage power to get things done, uh, that, that humility is not um, a core piece of, of one's strategy for uh, ascending to you know, the top of an organization. Hmm. Uh, and he, he, he could probably say that better than I, I would, but uh, I know that in his book, he, he talks about how humility is, is not something that uh, leaders necessarily need to embrace. It's kind of a popular in vogue thing. Uh, but one that practically doesn't really work in uh, developing powerful and successful leaders. And hopefully with our accumulating kind of research and the publications that we have, that we're, we hope to be able to change that, that view. Yeah. Um, so uh, there is a unique kind of power that is associated with humility and leaders who are willing to take kind of the short-term sacrifices to lay this foundation where everybody um, feels free and kind of liberated to grow, to, to admit mistakes, but then also learn and that the leader is, is investing, kind of building this legacy of continual learning and credit sharing um, that actually can lead to very powerful economic outcomes. Wow. Uh, so. yeah. Very cool. Well, Brad, thank you so much again for um, coming on the podcast. It's been fun talking to you and getting to learn more about your background that even over the years of working with you, I didn't know. So thanks so much for, for sharing all of that. Oh, you're welcome, Amber. It's been a privilege being with you. Thanks for listening. If you have questions, comments, suggestions, or requests, contact me at www.moralsciencepodcast.com. The Moral Science Podcast is sponsored by ERA Inc., a research and design think tank that's reinventing how people interact with each other. Music throughout the program is My Kruby by Kindswider and can be found at freemusicarchive.org. <laughs>